Well, thank you, uh, Mayor, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> um, I will, you know, you kind of dig back a few decades here, and I will tell you how it all started, because I think that'd be kind of fun, and nobody really knows the story here. Um, but we've all heard of Les Biederman, yep. okay? Ross Biederman's the son that's still pioneering the WTCM and a bunch of other things. Um, when I went to school here back in the, in the Stone Age, I got to know Les Biederman a little bit. And he sort of, I, was, I made the first recruitment film for NMC in 1973. And uh, it's buried in a dirt pile over there now in their time capsule, uh, uh, which is a, it's a reverent kind of thing. It's not a, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so when what I format got, is it? huh? What format? 16 millimeter. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything. <laughs> So, um, but back then, uh, I made this film. He sort of thought that was interesting and that somebody was doing something with film because film is very cumbersome. It's not like today. It's like you shoot a, a silent piece of celluloid with sprockets on it, somehow line up some sound with it with sprockets on it and merge them together in a lab and wherever and try to print it and blah, blah. It's a, it is so different than, than video production today. Um, because it was expensive, you couldn't reuse anything. It was, it, but at the same time, it had this art component, this trust that is a little absent today. Uh, we see stuff immediately. We can find out uh, if it's good or not immediately. Where back then, there was this mystery that lasted a week sometimes, right? And it was like, it was like well, how long is it going to take to get this back? You know, well, I'll hurry and hopefully the car doesn't break down and all this. Anyway, I'm leading all around to this thing. So I finished the film for the college and uh, uh, later went out west, went to film school out there, came back here, and I met with Les Biederman, the old man, in his office downtown, and he was classic uh, for his cigar. He always had a big cigar and really thick glasses. So I sat in his office and I said, uh, what do you think about me setting up a film company up here? And he looked at me and he kind of laughed and took a suck off of this god awful rope piece of. <laughs> and, uh, but then he pointed to some photographs on his wall behind him, and there was pictures of like the Allegheny and a bunch of other maritime things he had done, the radio station, uh, WPBN. He brought cable TV to, Michigan, to, to northern Michigan. Uh, it was called Midwestern Cablevision then. He had all these things, the college, I mean, just go down this huge list of stuff and there are all these photographs and he took this big drag off of this big stinky thing and and he goes I'm the wrong guy to ask and I thought that is that's all the encouragement I needed right there <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he and that was it because he was saying look if you believe in it who gives a uh, crap if uh, <laughs> If what I think, and it was it was true. So that was sort of my in inspiration for this thing. Because up here there was nothing. Uh, if you made a TV commercial for uh, somebody in town, you would print it on 16 millimeter, on a 19 foot roll that was this big around, and they would rack it on a telecine. And when that commercial was ready to run, they would hit a go button, and the, the projector would go, and they would play your ad. That's the state of affairs at the beginning of this whole thing. But then video showed up in the 80s, which totally sucked. I hated it. Mainly because it was, it was linear. You had to edit. If you wanted to change your mind about an edit, you would have to, it's all a function of dubbing onto another piece of tape. So you would have to, if you change your mind or want to shorten a scene, you would have to find where that is and then redub from there out. Very cumbersome, very horrible. And then computers showed up, thankfully, and now it's all nonlinear again like film was. So I'm t totally happy with all of it now. So I think that's kind of that whole bit. What I want to do tonight is uh, share with you uh, how we make movies. And we've done it a bunch. We didn't just start this. So it's, yeah, I've learned a ton of lessons. Uh, and I will try to share some of that with you tonight. And uh, luckily, I've got some of the, my wonderful crew with me tonight, too. And they can jump in and uh, fact check things I say if, it's, if they're not uh, right. I know Amber will. Uh, Dan's not allowed to. Uh, so what I want to do is show you the beginning of, I want to show you a video that a friend of mine made, a photographer, Don Rutt, uh, on the set of Dogman, just to show you what we've been doing. So Naomi, you want to hit that? Yes.
Well, that's all the fun part of it, and uh, it's pretty amazing. But just to back up a, a notch is kind of the, where I've uh, evolved in this whole crazy thing is to try to actually sell these movies. So uh, that's the trick. It's one thing to make a movie, and then it's another thing altogether to find a distributor that'll run with it. Um, the sad thing is, like the uh, Dogman One movie had, it got pirated on YouTube, and it had a hundred and Almost 200,000 views for free on YouTube. And it's like, really? And uh, so I shut it down five different times with Spanish subtitles. So it's like, okay, how do, and beautifully done Spanish subtitles. It was crazy. It wasn't one of you guys, I hope, doing this. Um, but it was kind of like the thing where you, you work hard to create a piece of marketable commercial art, and then some goofball somewhere in the world does that. And the, the problem then is I've got investors behind me that are believing in my ability to pull this off and then when that happens it's it's really a bad thing and it's not just me imagine the guys in Hollywood that are doing um, you know big films and then some clown pirates avatar or something you know it's like but anyway so uh, since I'm trying to do this thing in a commercial art kind of way we got to try to make it fit the fit the mold that, uh, that Hollywood wants the, that the distributors want I've heard actually stories from distributors that I have that filmmakers have contributed films to them that they liked, they liked the movie, and they want it, they want it represented, and then they need to have what's referred to as deliverables along with the movie. And it'd be kind of akin to um, buying a piece of real estate without a appraisal or a survey. It's like, yeah, I wanna buy that building on the corner. Okay, well, somebody's gotta quantify it with an appraisal or a survey or something. And if you just go, ah, screw that, I'll just buy it. Well, you, that industry is set up where you can't buy real estate without certain things. Same as this industry, where you cannot, these distributors will not represent your film in the normal routes if you don't have a bunch of certain things. Uh, for example, and I, I have a kind of a PowerPoint thing. Oh, wow, nice. By the way, Naomi worked on the movie too. She was a, uh, she, uh, came to us through a TBA, kind of, and uh, that was a, it was a good pick. So what I uh, got here is, I'm going to kind of, this is like the painful part of filmmaking, but I've, I don't really look at it like that. I look at it all as a process, because I cannot get to that fun thing you just watched until I've done what I'm about to show you. So go ahead, fire it up there. 
Um, so the first thing we do, well, the very first thing you do, even before this, is you write a screenplay. And they look, you know, like this, sort of, 100 pages roughly of whatever. And then armed with, this is the blueprint now for the whole, the whole movie. So once you have a screenplay, then you can try to go to get some investors if they like the story or like you or whatever. Then you um, hire an attorney to do this. Title search for Dogman 2, The Wrath of the Litter. This is before anything happens. So go ahead and go to the next one. So what happens then is this is the result of that. Conclusion, based on our findings, we recommend that you proceed with the title, Dogman 2, The Wrath of the Litter is a title. Oh, he's a typo there. Tittle. <laughs> you know, I should, I should get it. That's kind of weird. Yeah. I've never seen it this big. I've never. Um, anyway, as the tittle of your film, uh, we did not identify any items that would present a high level of risk, blah, blah, blah. This is a title report and opinion, even with the word tittle in it. Um, and without that, this is one of 80 things that have to be with the movie when you go to a distributor. If you don't have a title report and opinion, they're just going to sit there and go, you're not ready to talk to us. And it's as simple as that. And you're not, they're not going to represent the film. So you got to have that. So luckily, uh, Dogman 2, The Wrath of the Litter, nobody's made one yet, mercifully. So go ahead and fire it up. And then, uh, okay, then armed with that screenplay, you need to get, you, know, you got to go copyright the thing. And there's all sorts of ways to, to do different things. Like people talk about filing with the Writers Guild or whatever. Nobody in Hollywood really cares about that. They want this. So you, you get a, uh, it's a, it's a PA uh, document or whatever they call it, PAU, I guess. And so this was, uh, this is the screenplay. And, and uh, so what I've copyrighted way back at the beginning was, was the actual screenplay. Once the movie is done, I have to get in another one of these for the movie itself. That's what they care about. And they, so there's that. And uh, so that's that. So go ahead and uh, chain of title certificate of origin. You got to prove that you're, you made it in the good old US and that there's a paper trail here. And again, without this document, your distributor will just sit there and look at you like you're nothing. So it's, and that's that. Even though it's, it's just a document, but you got to have it. Go ahead and go to the next one, you know. Then, uh, since we're running a business out of this thing, we have to file uh, uh, with the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs at the, uh, this is in the, uh, uh, this is the Michigan version of that. So they give you that ID number, and now you're a legitimate business, but you got to, to get this, you got to do a bunch of other crap too. But, so now you have that. Okay, go to the next one. And then you got to do the same thing for the federal. Uh, every one of these things is required by a distributor, and I haven't even thought about casting this thing yet. I have not even picked locations. I've written the screenplay, and I have a dream, but I haven't, I'm not putting the cart before the horse on any of this stuff. Without these things, you got nothing. Uh, combination. It's a good question. The question was, do, do I do it or does my attorney do it? It's a, it's a combination. And uh, um, I would say on this stuff, the attorney does more of it, but it'll get polluted here in a minute. Uh, okay, go ahead and roll to the next. Then, Right, you got that script that you, that you love. You send it to this place called Hollywood Script Research, which is one of just a few in the country that will do this. And again, you have to have this done. It's a script clearance report. And uh, they read this thing like, I, I don't know who reads, I don't know how they do this, but they look for weird things that be, might become a copyright problem based on the screenplay. And they report it. Uh, okay, this is just the cover page. Uh, go, okay, here's, here's the comments. So, Meg Samuels, page four, we find no conflict. Okay, that's cool. That means I get to use the name Meg Samuels, which I just created out of my head. But I have had situations like this where they said, Meg Samuels, well, or whatever, cannot use this name. Change it to Meg Samuelson or something, or whatever. But they do this. Cynthia identified by first name only. Go ahead and hit the next one. I'm not going to read all these, but um, radio plays. He changes it, lands on a Steve Cook legend. Song is underway. Music clearance advice for any recognizable portion of a copyrighted melody heard. They're reminding me that I can't just steal music, even though Steve Cook's one of the uh, 
um, consultants on this movie, and I have a written document that says he gave me the ability to use that move, the music for this movie. So I've already f covered that, but they're reminding me. Um, blah, blah, blah. Footage from a large factory, blazing fire. Okay, presu they're presuming that all film clips will be created especially for this production and not duplicate any copyrighted material. I bought licensed fire footage for this scene, and I have a document that proves it. And uh, go ahead and... Uh, Rich, would all this be considered part of chain of title? No. Okay. No, chain of title is just the, just the basics. Who wrote it? Did it? Was it adapted from something else? And who owns it now? Okay. That's all chain of title is. And in my case, I wrote it. It's part of this. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty short, simple form. But if it was adapted from the, you know, the legend of Dan Kelly, Benzonia, you know, and then it was adapted to, you know, this, yep. that would have to show up so that people could figure out where this thing came from. Um, look at this, uh, number 10, animal control vehicle races by. It's written right in the script. Advise, avo uh, advise avoid identification of any city, town, or county animal control department. That's their advice. Well, it's County. we got Benzie County, uh, and they love us, and we had them sign off on the use of their names in their movie. So there's been, we had, I don't know how many cop cars we so had there. <laughs> uh, most of them were there for the movie. There were a couple there for Naomi when she got out of tro into trouble. Uh, but we had Benzie counties all over this movie, but they, they signed off on it. So, yes, it's an issue. They advise to avoid it. I advise, I, my verdict was just embrace it and not screw with it. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Did you want me to go on? <laughs> yeah, just keep going. Anyway, you get the general idea. I just want to show you. I don't have to go through this. End of report. Um, pulls out number. Whose number is it? Call it. Hit a few button. It voids. I did it. You know, they try to tell you what to avoid so that you don't end up in tr with trouble later. And again, without this document, which is seven pages long, the distrib distributor will not listen to you. How much does that cost? To have $1,000. That document was $1,000. For a feature length script or any... I don't know what the, what the protocol is for shorts, <laughs> but feature length, this has to be this way. So it's $1,000, and uh, that's just it. And you gotta just, I, I, when I first started doing this, I was like, what, seriously? Because I know most of this stuff, but it, it's like, it doesn't matter what I know. They wanna, the distributor wants to know that you were told and you were able to implement this stuff. Who did you go through to get this done? This one? Yeah. Hollywood Script Research in, in LA, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I think I, I went online and I found a, uh, a stringer for a, for a uh, network that I think he was a, a fireman himself or used to be. And magically he was showed up right when these fires started. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I had some just kick-ass shots of these big buildings burning. It was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island is where we used it. But I, again, it's licensed. I got a document. He, it's not exclusive to me. It's just for the movie, uh, in my case. He can sell it to whoever he wants to beyond me. So it was 150 bucks, I think, for that. Uh, okay, so then, you know, somewhere all in all this is like, okay, you're going to try to find some investors to help you realize your dream. And then they want to see stuff like a marketing plan. Hey, what a concept. And uh, remember, I have a shot. I haven't done anything. I've not cast this movie. I have not done look for locations. I haven't done any of that because it's just not ready yet for that. I'm really linear. I'm a very linear person. I get a little annoyed when I see people scouting locations and picking talent before any of these other things were done because it's like, really? You know, you're not, you're, you, ah, you know, it's okay. Let get this stuff out of the way then you, you, then you get into the meat and the potatoes. Even though I completely understand doing it the other way around, it's just that it, uh, this is how I've done it. And so again, everything I'm telling you is how I've kind of molded into this thing. Anyway, so DVD uh, on the left, uh, creation of key art, blah, 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 12 weeks prior to National Street Day to Doug, blah, 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 and then video on demand, broadcast, press, uh, sales projections. Um, they're looking at, I don't know what, but anyway, this is important for investors to look at stuff like this. And, uh, okay, now, I finally can get into making my movie, sort of. <laughs> And so what, what I do is, and this is 
this, everything I'm going to tell you is like really logical. It just makes perfect sense, I hope. So how long, okay, how do you begin to decide how long it's going to take to shoot this movie? So you take the screenplay again, which is the blueprint, and I go down each scene with a pencil. I read the script, and with a pencil, I write down my best guess on how many hours it's going to take to shoot that scene. And these are the, on the left are the scene numbers, on the right are the hours. Assuming that I can cluster company moves to a minimum and all that jazz. I'll go down the whole screenplay like that, and then I'll wait a couple days, and I'll do it backwards, counting from the last scene forward. And I'll hide the first number. And then I'll unveil it, and it's like, oh, wow, they both said three. I'm sticking with three, you know. And sometimes they were different, but go to the next one then, if you could. And then basically, it's a, I think this is an Excel. And so 120 hours, basically, of, of shoot time. Not counting company moves and whatever, but generally that. Okay, so then you go, okay, well, my mantra is to shoot this stuff in three weeks. I don't remember offhand how many hours are in three weeks, but it's more than that. So, uh, right? Are you doing the math? I'm taking notes. Oh, nice. <laughs> that's yours. And so, um, that's great. So anyway, I figure 120 hours to shoot this movie. Uh, and then you pad that when you're going down through the actual breakdown, and you'll see that in a minute. But that gives me a really good roadmap to take to my uh, associate producer, who then does what's coming up next. Oops. Well, Not next. While that's going on, I'm starting to cast the movie. So I, I, you know, I get all the characters on a board, and this, this board changes depending on who I'm actually going to get. Obviously, the, the top four on the top of the, uh, the board, they're not Lorna, but the other four are part of the original movie. So they were critical to have back. And, man, that was, uh, there was, it was his agent did not want to sign to this movie too early because he might have gotten a better offer. He was just in Pacific Rim, you know, uh, and he got paid more in, for that bit in Pacific Rim than he ever get here probably. Could they have told you you couldn't use Meg Samuel's name like after you'd already used it in the first dog movie? No, because I had that same script report okay. on the first one too. I was going to say that doesn't make sense. Yeah, <laughs> no. But it's, it's a, that's a good question. But because I did, I'd done this once before with the first draft, for the first version of Dogman, I knew all those names were cleared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they just brought them up again. But his agent did not want to sign too early. Okay, I'm practical. I try to get this stuff done early. I don't want to wait till the last minute on stuff. You know, I like to sleep at night and horse around and come here and drink whatever this drink is. And, uh, and uh, so I like to do stuff early. These guys, I could have signed him almost three months earlier, but his agent would not do that. Flat out wouldn't do it. I finally, uh, at, I, think it was, I think it was four weeks out, I gave him an ultimatum. I said, I have to know tonight, yes or no. And... I was willing to write him out of this, this version of Dogman. I was going to, I don't know who saw the original Dogman, but he got hurt pretty bad in the first one, and I was going to have him not make it. But then I'd have to replace him with somebody that was like his brother, basically, who's always had the hots for Dorothy and blah, blah you know, whatever. And uh, so, I mean, I could have I evolved a decent screenplay out of that. It would have meant some rewriting, obviously, and I didn't, four weeks out, I don't want to be rewriting a screenplay, you know? <laughs> So I gave these guys the ultimatum, and they finally said, fine, because he wanted to do it. And that was, the, that, was that. So anyway, OK. Hey, Rich. Yeah. If you'd have had to you know, rewrite that screenplay four weeks out, then would you have had to go on through the whole business of getting the screenplay vetted by that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, he asked if, uh, if I would have had to have the whole new script clearance report done if I'd have rewritten it. Um, I might have been able to. Uh, explain what parts, I did. Yeah, at least the parts that you rewrote. Yeah. But that would have been a big rewrite. Yeah, I know. I wasn't looking forward to that. <laughs> did you have to file another copyright, too, on the screenplay? Uh, no, I wouldn't have done that because that's, this all, all this stuff is, falls under the revision okay. clause. Okay. That's, a, that's a good question, though, too. Um, okay, so this is a stack. So while I'm making the movie, while all these things are starting to get a little crazy here. This is a stack of Screen Actors Guild BS. Okay, go to the next slide. This will crack you up. Yeah, those rat bastards. Thank you. Look at this. Look at that tape measure on the right. I did that because you guys wouldn't have a sense of it. That thing is two inches thick. It's written in like microfiche, and it's like, really? And they do that deliberately to 
to just be able to say they told me so. It's like, well, it's in there. Didn't you read it? And it's like, really? The 2005 SAG codified basic agreement. Uh, and Michigan's a right to work state now. So right this, you know, since Snyder took over. So it's like, I'm not even sure what clout those guys have anyway. But nonetheless, we have to play their game. And uh, I'm just really watching my language here a little bit. <laughs> So anyway, so the SAG thing is still not over. It's still not over. And, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. And if you want to see me just get really angry, bring that up, and I'll tell you more about them. But they're not doing their members any favors. I guess that's the biggest thing. OK. OK, so while all that's going on, my associate producer is taking those hours, expected hours, anticipated hours to shoot the movie and putting them into a, into a functioning schedule. Uh, and she'll look at things like, okay, well, we, we, we always follow the money, so Larry Joe Campbell's the most expensive one out there, so we got to make sure his stuff is, is organized so that we don't have an empty day for him in the middle someplace. He also had to go back to L.A. on Fridays every, and every week, so he only worked four days on and then left for a long weekend and then came back on Sunday and worked four more days. Okay, so to accommodate that, and then you got locations, you know, the tavern, uh, this is this is day one on September 9th and um, but it's kind of fun because this is this is when you really start putting your brain at the at on the job and you just picture yourself okay well we're gonna all meet together like we all did uh, at seven o'clock at the hungry tummy which is uh, I on the map which you'll see in a minute everything is organized so nobody can say they didn't know where it was we had, then uh, 45 minutes later we split and head to Purvis house which is another location on the map and et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing we shot in this entire movie was scene 18. Interior day, Hank and Dorothy put away groceries. Hank finds a still frozen swamp, buck heart, and a trash. Pull, they puts it in back in the freezer, looks at Lorna's stuff piled in the living room. Lorna's mooching off of these guys uh, and living on their couch, basically. So he's just getting mad. So that was the first scene in this entire movie, even though it's scene 18. Then we jump to scene 53, which is way later. Uh, before, this is all before lunch on the first day. Uh, interior afternoon and see now that's helpful because we didn't have to go to nights you know so we're doing daytime at this house interior both of them are interiors but that one could play later in the afternoon so if we wanted to fuss with the lights to give it a little more warmth we could we're legal that's why it says afternoon Hank's getting a drink Dorothy walks in and tells him that Lorna is just sitting in her car Hank wants a burger when in that little short you saw uh, Hank carrying Fran uh, Lorna out on his shoulders he basically threw her ass out, and now they, he comes back in the house, and that's where this scene happens. But in his brain, none of that stuff has happened yet. It's all out of order. So the whole knack of this thing is to try to talk to your actors so that they are put in that moment, even though, look at that, scene 18 and scene 53, and then it's lunch. Um, you know, and then, you know, 58, 59, this, now it's nighttime, so the reason we did that was because we could start to, it's all interior, night, so we can start darkening the house so that it looks like night. And that's going to take a little while. And uh, so we figured over lunch we could just start thinking about that and doing that kind of thing. And it doesn't just mean drape your windows with black visqueen, because then if it's just blackout, sometimes that doesn't play that well either. So a lot of times we'll wad up a bunch of neutral density filters gels and put those on the windows and it'll turn the window instead of daylight it'll just turn it into just this really deep blue but it's using daylight to do it and that way it you still see the outline of the window you still but you feels like it's nighttime so that all would have to happen before we did uh, 58 and 59 um, so that's just day one so this was this was this version which was the last version we did was um, the 18th of August so that's three weeks before the shoot. And we had an absolute definitive shoot schedule for day one. And if we screwed up on this thing, it would just get nutty, you know, because then it would, you know, fall into the next day. Go ahead and go. I got the whole first week here. Um, so there's Tuesday. Assuming day one went right, this is going to fall right into place too. We're still at the same location, so all of our equipment and trailers and all our crap can be pleasant. Everything's fine and blah, blah, blah. So there's that. These are all day scenes. Okay, go to, go to Wednesday, same thing. Keeping in mind this was done three weeks before the shoot. It's super cool because of that. You guys had the schedule so that, like, 
not only you got all of Hank's stuff done first, but we also did all one location at one time. Right, that's like, tricky. Her, Naomi's question or comment really is that, okay, yeah, we had to get Hank shot out on the first four days of this week, but also we were able to get it was no hit that before. location wrapped out also. That was impressive. Yeah, that was. <laughs> but remember, it's his house, so he's usually there. So yeah. that, that worked out. Um, okay, go ahead and go to Thursday, same thing. And then uh, go to Friday. Now, Hank is missing on Friday now. He's already gone. So now we're doing other stuff. Tow truck driver. We have new actors showing up now. We did, um, uh, we've got a paramedic here. Uh, whoop, Dogman 3 kills him. So there's some action here at the bottom there on uh, scene 26. Yep. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, but Larry Joe Campbell's gone. So it's like you, just, you go away. We'll we'll do our other stuff. And these are just, all these scene numbers just start chinking in the the screenplay, and it's such a gratifying thing to start seeing these things get checked off because we we'll, eventually we have a movie, but not after the first week. We don't have enough to do a movie yet. Okay, go ahead. What's next? Okay, so this is really super cool. So there's the there's the whole schedule across the top, the, the three weeks. We give everybody, every, everything we need, generally, is over here. Posse Man 1, Posse Man 2, Flat Tire Man, Lloyd, Lorna, whatever. And you can just find out where they're needed. We, we call this a bowling chart. This is not commonly used in, in Hollywood, but I find it, we kind of created this because it was so practical. And uh, you can just at a glance, without having to dig through any of this other crap, it's like, wait a minute, when do we need Cynthia? You know, she might call, hey, when, when am I there? I go, oh, all right. Well, you're there on the 17th, on the 22nd, and 23rd. Oh, okay, got it, thanks. Quick and, uh, and, and accurate. So once we've got the whole thing designed, then we create this thing. Um, and it's... The double X's represent interior versus exterior? Day or night? Day and night. Day and night? Oh, yep. okay. Yeah, there's a key on the bottom or someplace. Uh, again, this was on the 21st, August 21st. So this thing was created right after the, the actual shooting schedule, but right after, three days later. Yep. Okay, here's another way of looking at it. This is something the, uh, the, the SAG requires, which actually is one of the, is there like two things they, out of a thousand that they actually make sense. This is one of them. And they want to know how, you know, when, how many days is Lloyd working? And boom, you can just tell. It's two half days and that's it. You know, those are the two days. But they don't recognize half days, so it's all full days for those guys. So we, again, based on the screenplay that turned into this actual shooting schedule that turned into the bowling chart, then we're able to create a document like this. And they all should match, theoretically. Then, here's another one that's super cool. This is kind of driven by the locations more. And again, day one, day two, the first three days we were at Hank's house. And it, it clearly says that on this thing. And, it, and what's fun about these is these, these numbers here, that's how many hours I expected it to take that day. So if we're sitting there, and the first day should have been eight hours, might have been a little longer because we were just getting our gear out and people were just getting stuff set up. But, you know, look at them. There's, not, well, there's one that's 10, but that's it. And they, it's, it's, once in a while, it would, it would vary from that. Sometimes it was less, um, but my... If everything goes pretty well, usually those are right on. The problem happens is if, if there's weather, mechanical thing. We had dogman creatures that were slowing us down. Um, and so, you know, unforeseen lightning storms and stuff like that. Um, so sometimes that, but if you if you're go into it with, with an attitude of not killing your crew or your cast, then, and I hope this is true, is that then if something goes wrong and you need their time and you just got to hang in there a little longer, they don't hate you, I hope. <laughs> yeah, well, Dan sort of hates me, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. But then, so then you do that, you know, and there, there's another way of looking at it. And the scene numbers are on the right. Basically, every scene in the movie is written over there, so you can kind of look at it if you want to find out, where, where the hell are we doing scene 44? It's like, oh, yeah, day four. Boom. So it's just kind of easy access to the information. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay, yet another version uh, with a little more detail. Um, 
I kind of like this one better in a lot of ways. Um, but you get the idea. I don't need to go through it. But uh, there's three of these, one for each week. And then it's done. Oddly, our, our busiest and most confusing day was the last day of the shooting. Do you guys agree with that? Or was it only me? I don't know. <laughs> well, anyway, so the reference to the, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are the ABCs, whatever, for the uh, positions that accompany the shooting schedule so that everybody knows what we're talking about and where is, where is B, where is A, where is whatever. Just a polite thing to do. We always throw that in there. Uh, this was interesting on this movie because we were in the valley on Narrow Gauge Road in Beulah, and... This was a complete screw up on my behalf, but it was like, oh wow, sun doesn't set till after seven. That's great, you know? Well, the problem is that piece of narrow gauge is like in the valley, and then on top of the mountain on both sides is another, there's 100 foot trees. So the sunset is easily two hours earlier there. So that meant all of our expectations for a little magic hour kind of thing. And if it was bright sun out, that shadow was just moving across the road. If it was overcast, it would have been fine. But we were blessed with the uh, amazing gift of bright sun to do a horror movie. And, uh, but it worked. And Amber actually, I asked her, how, do you ra how can you rationalize that for me? So that it, I can not just cringe. Well, it was it, driving you crazy. Yeah, it was, yeah. Do you want to tell them what you came up with? You remember? There you go. And I applaud that because here's the thing about filmmaking in general. And she, she's, I think she's right, too. She's not just kidding. But it's, it's, what's cool about that is that filmmaking is a massive amount of rationalizations. And, um, and uh, you know, I would have loved it to be just flat out overcast the whole month of September. But that just didn't happen. And... Uh, and then you start shooting the first couple days and it's blue sky and there's not a cloud in the sky. It's like, okay, now what happens if it gets overcast for the rest of September? You know, it's like, oh man, you know, but you gotta just go, you know, press on regardless. And uh, we are color timing everything. So that what's gonna happen in the final show, which I don't have tonight, but we're, uh, we have a colorist that's uh, just yanking all the chroma out of it because we're not doing a chamber of commerce pure michigan ad here you know so there's every all the skin tones turn gray the blacks are just black and um, it's pretty it's going to be pretty cool so okay so anyway okay then we get call sheets um uh my first assistant director uh laura burnell she's amazing she's worked with me on at least three other movies and um these are hard to make uh they look kind of simple, I guess, but, man, I don't know. But anyway, she takes the standard. This is a standard uh, sheet. She will put our information on it poof, so that everybody knows what's going on. And it's, it's very helpful. And, uh, Rich, what was the maximum number of company moves in a day? Uh, you know, that's, we really kept that to a, a minimum. When we were out on that county road, this old farmhouse on the lower left, this was kind of amazing. Uh, this old farmhouse, here's, this is looking one direction in front of that house. Can you scroll up a little bit? No, it's just a sign. Okay, well down here, picture this down here, <laughs> looking the other way. And uh, let's just try this, this might work. Maybe. Anyway, the point is you can, you can stand right literally in front of that road, look in one direction and not see any houses look the other direction, and it's the same thing. So this house that's only a mile three from Beulah, all of a sudden is, is in the middle of nowhere. Plus it's in this valley, and the valley takes a turn, so it's quiet in there. You don't hear the Jake breaks from 31 rumbling around. Yeah, there's the other side. There we go. 
So that, you know, so you could look down. So what we were able to do because of that is we used that house as a base camp for all of our stuff. We didn't use it in the movie. We used it as a base camp. So I had uh, electricity run to it. Uh, consumers uh, put a drop there. So we didn't have to mess around with generators. Had quiet 200 amps of power all the time. Could run heaters and coffee pots and everything else, trailers and stuff. And then we basically stepped 150 feet or whatever towards this road and now we're in the fictitious highway 29 mode i just can't shoot that direction back at the house that's all and then when we're done with this and we closed the road off for five days too with the road commission let us close that off naomi was one of the guards uh took a few naps i'm thinking up there uh, <laughs> but um so we were but, but that's a good question dude it was because or whoever asked or joe yeah um because I was able to use that house as a base camp, and this road was right there, and the, all the woods for the, all the woods for this movie are right behind the house, I could stay. We could park once we're parked there. We're there. Wow. So that was part of the amazing uh, wonderfulness of this whole thing. It just it was it was fantastic. What do you guys do the bowling alley? Is that a secret? No. No. In fact, I got a whole scene in a minute. I'll show you what we shot there. A lot of it anyway. Cool. Uh, Amber took that picture. She takes pictures crooked a lot. Amazing uh, paint job in there. Yeah, by the I know. Way. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But we were able to get the county uh, dog catcher vehicles and all this other stuff. And anyway, go ahead and go to the next one. What's that? Amber was just was talking. To, I mean, I, we probably didn't make more than one or two company moves in a week. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and everything was within a little we bit of, it, of itself. Three days at the Swanders Farm, so it was very good coming out. Oh, it was great. So then, uh, this is just my own scratchings now. Back, this was back in April. Uh, I had already started um, casting back then, even for this thing, and I was hoping Hank would come back. The handwritten numbers, that's how many days they'd be working. And then when I, when I was on the phone able to get them, and they agreed to it on the phone, I would send them a deal memo and I would mark an X off in this column that told me that I already sent them a deal memo. And then when this stuff started showing back up signed, then I would check the second box. And this is the only way I can operate, is to be super organized like that so that it's just, you know, you can't, I, my brain won't remember who's filed. I'm not gonna go digging through a filing cabinet to try to find out who didn't get there. This, this is how I do it, again, that's, but that's back five months almost, four and a half months before the shoot. And then here's a deal memo for the talent. This is an example of one, Marianne Mayberry. This is how simple it can be. Now we're a signatory for the Screen Actors Guild, rat bastards, uh, under the modified low budget agreement. And, uh, and this is through her agent, blah, blah, blah. There's her days for the term. I blocked out the compensation, blah, blah. She gets three meals a day, uh, plus $50 a day for non-shoot days for food. Because I provide food, three meals a day, I don't need to do per diems. That's how the SAG works. Um, credit, who gets what, whatever. Exact credit billing should read what. Because I don't want to get there later and go, have to make another phone call. You know, well, how do you want your, you know, it's like, God, just do it early. So go to the next page. This is page one. Page two, additional production days, talks about that, travel and housing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, State of Michigan, and there it is, boom, done. And that's it. Sadly, Screen Actors Guild wants their own agreement signed. So we are literally right now having all these contracts re-signed. Even though everybody's been paid, it's done, and it says exactly the same stuff. They want their own. You do it after the fact. Absolutely. But they, they determined that after you Yes. Were... Yeah. Just showed up. Oh, we don't like these. We want ours. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it is. Okay. Here's the crew. Here's all here's the crew people that we had. Again, signed and sent and whatever. Um, you know, everybody's kind of on there somewhere. And that's that's that. Do so you have to the, add a person like later? Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, but then I would just deal with it and do it. You know, it's when you have 20 of these things out there that it gets a little nutty. Yeah, go ahead and go to the next one. And then here's a deal, standard. It's a one page. I think it's a one page deal memo for the crew. This is generally what everybody. This is Amber's. Um, uh, but you know, it just basically says when, what, how, how do you want your screen credit to read, travel, blah blah blah. And that's that. So that she understands, what, or everybody understands what they're getting themselves into. Because I don't, it can't be that, hey, I thought you were paying for mileage, or I thought you were going to, you know, whatever, you know. It's like, well, there it is. By the way, SAG, I pay 55 cents a mile for mileage. You know what SAG's number is? 30. But I, I because I did these, I honored 55, but it was like, really? 30? That's, that was like the 80s, was it? No, anyway, scoot ahead. Um, again, part of the organization, uh, this is the Dogman creatures themselves. There were six of them. I, in the screenplay, I numbered each one, so that it, was, it was confusing enough. A uh, little spoiler alert here, there's six of them. Um, and then, the, okay, what is Creature 1 doing? Boom. It's 2, it's 26, 27, blah, blah, blah. Kills a flat tire man, drums on trees in scene 45. Gets hit with a golf club at 67. Oh, number one, yeah, I got it. Number two, the turf, he's the whatever, blah, blah. Throws rocks, dies from a police gunfire. For, you know, he's dead in, in 45. Uh, 30, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this was critical because this Dogman stuff was, I had to rely on other vendors to help me create these things. And man, that was just a wiggly um, deal. But anyway, you get the idea. These are some early drawings on how that whole thing was going to be built. Um, you know, how do you make a human look like a dog kind of thing? It's kind of cool. That is cool. Who did that? You? No. Who said Buzz? Yep. <laughs> this local uh, engineer who's Fantastic. kind of off the charts brilliant. And, uh, uh, but he, he, it's, it's sort of surprising he did this much paperwork because... He doesn't do paperwork. He's terrible at accounting, and he, but he loves this stuff. Um, go ahead and scoot to the next one. That's him on the right. And this guy, uh, Dan, who was wearing the martial arts t-shirt, Dan is actually shorter, I think, or maybe he's the same size as Buzz. But just with the stilts themselves, which are down in this thing, that raises him up that much more already. And these are all martial arts guys that we had in the... Uh, in these suits because we needed him to not fall and get hurt. And then he had to know how to move, you know, and all that. And then the heads, I didn't think to bring one, but they're basically watch, looking out. The helmet sits up here. The head, the model of the head, the dogman head sits up here. They actually look out through the neck hole. And then the, the head of the dogman itself, when that's just a skull of it, is all radio controlled so they can articulate eyes, ears, eyebrows, jaw, stuff like that, all radio controlled. Pretty cool. So anyway, you get it. So all stuff starting to go simultaneously. Um, okay, here's this is a letter I just got, but it's uh, but we initiated this a long time ago. Whenever you have an animal on a movie, and and I, I'm going to say it again, I don't do this because I want to. I just do it because I have to because the distributor will not take the film unless I do the, all these things. So the American Humane Association. Um, Absolutely has to be present for any live animals. Not our dogman guys. They don't care about people. They're, they want the critters. So we had two scenes in this movie that had live animals, live dogs. Dead animals are okay, though. As long as they weren't killed for the sake of the movie. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's important. Yeah, but I would have to get a note from the sheriff as to why they were killed or if they were hit by a car or something. You know. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So the AHA actually sends... A representative in from, I think she's from Chicago, I kind of think. Um, she drives up, and I've worked with her on a bunch of movies now, so she knows I'm not the type that's going to abuse this, but still, she has to be there to watch out for our dogs. And uh, we had two different days of shooting. She came up twice from Chicago. It's incredible. But then we had to submit a rough cut, which I already have now, and I haven't got the approval yet, but I don't see any reason why not. They just don't want to make sure that the animals were not that they weren't bamboozled somehow in the, in the process, you know. Wait a minute, you shot something that we didn't see you shoot, you know, that kind of thing. These guys are hooked, 
at the hips with sag, so they're both enormously powerful. And, but these guys are cool, actually. All right. Uh -huh. And you're going to scream through this, but what we do is, this is a crew list, just, just race on through this. This is our all, all of our uh, cast and crew, and, and it's all their contact stuff. And, and I, we, we publish this, so that, at least to ourselves, so we can keep track of everybody, so we don't, have to, we don't lose sight of how if we get, got to get a hold of somebody fast, you know, kind of thing. But it, it comes down to the restaurants, their names, the phone numbers, the blah, blah, blah. Um, there's Naomi's. Dogman consultant, Steve Cook. You know, but it's everybody. It's like everybody's on this list. Grocery store, tavern. Who owns the tavern? How do you get a hold of them? You know, how close is the hospital? Where's the, what's the hospital's number? Where's the defibrillator coming from? Where's Lauren's car coming from? Where are these cars coming from? Who's doing the behind the scenes? You know, where's the t-shirts coming from? Porter um, Johns. You know, so that's just a, that's something we do. That's, that's not a small task creating a document like that, but it certainly is appreciated. And also, also later it's nice for the crew to get together and they want to know how to get a hold of each other. You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of cool. Michigan Film Office, they were helpful. Rich, did you say you did not have a DIT person on set? Yeah, we did not have a DIT. So how did you just manage the media? I mean, who's, whose role is that? Henry Joy, my assistant cameraman, did it. And uh, the logic there was, um, first of all, I shoot everything film style. So I'm not rolling enormous amounts of data around. I shoot it like it's still sprocketed, so I kind of respect it. And uh, so it's like a, maybe an eight to one somewhere in there, maybe 10 some scenes, but generally it's something like that. And uh, so he had enough time to run out periodically and download a card off the Alexa and bring it back empty. And uh, sometimes I'd be going, where'd Henry go? And that's like, it's okay. So because it was just him, there was no serious protocol about that? No, it was perfect. Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. And uh, yep. And we, we didn't lose one frame, not one, not one frame. But it didn't require a whole person to do that in our movie. Um, I didn't require it. And he could have waited all day and do it, done them later at night, but he just could pick at it. And if we shot 20 minutes, he'd get that off and then put that, you know, it's manageable. It's a good question, though, because that whole DIT thing is a huge piece of the digital cinema nowadays, and it's, uh, and bigger Hollywood films rely on it. You know, they, they, their expectations is there's an entire DIT department managing the workflow. And, uh, but I, you know, whatever. So let me get into the props. Uh, go ahead and know who's, who's bringing the police scanner, who's bringing the bar phone, uh, Meg's glass of beer, you know, all this stuff. Who's doing this? Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's, again, it's a checklist kind of thing. You can go ahead and keep. And then here's the, uh, okay, we had beer. Surprising, isn't it? Um, Shorts Brewery uh, gave us a bunch of cases of uh, um, uh, soft parade. Thank you. Who said that? Oh, oh, you weren't even there. Okay, yeah, there you go. It was soft parade. Yeah. Anyway, soft. So, but you know, again, because they're featured in the film, I don't just go, "Hey, thanks." You know, it's like, yeah, I just say, "Hey, thanks." Can you sign this? Because again, the distributor at the other end of the pipe is going to say, you're clearly seeing that beer. Oh, that's cool, because Joe Shorts is a friend. They're, they're, they're cool. They're going to go, really? Well, we'll just wait here while you get the note. You know? And they will. So that's, that's kind of what it is. And it basically tells you that I own, or my company owns um, solely the results and proceeds of this photography of that product. Boom. Go ahead. All right. Does anybody have any, you're firing questions out that are good ones, so feel free to do that again. But does anybody have any questions up before I get into the actual meat and potatoes, the, the shooting parts of it? Can you say how many days the pre-production, all of that, getting all of that paperwork before you even shot the first day of the series? How long, how many hours went into that? Uh, Oh, that's a really good question. I know that it's probably took about six months, but I was I'm doing commercial stuff too, and so it's uh, always on the background. Those are every day something's getting yeah. checked off the list that you've got to provide right. on the back end. Exactly. 
And that's why the checks are important, because I can get back to it and know right where I'm at at any given time. Plus, I can fire off a bunch of deal momos and leave for a while, you know? And uh, they come back magically, and I start to assemble that stuff. Locations were a big part of that, too. That's what those photographs were about. I kind of jumped over that. But All right. So here's uh, the first page of the screenplay. Uh, this guy's flat tire man's on the phone getting yelled at by his girlfriend or somebody. And uh, you don't hear her side of the conversation. It's one of these conversations. I had to do some homework on this one. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, the short story of it is he's getting bitched out by somebody. And he, go ahead and cr scroll down here. He hangs up. Shakes his head, disgusted. On the seat are a nice bundle of cut flowers. He rolls down the window, throws them out. <laughs> and it's funny. It's, this is all within the first 30 seconds of the movie. It's, I don't know, it's hilarious, uh, I think. Then he turns the radio on. He hears a little bit of a dogman song, which is a little homage to that. Then he blows a tire. He ends up out in the uh, desolate, fictitious Highway 29 with a blown tire and out of cell range. And he decides to change himself. And he does. But then, um, go ahead and keep, keep scrolling. He changes it. Matt, the uh, cell phone he used. I mean, you talk about product placement. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we didn't feature it. I didn't go for a close-up. Yeah. Could have been anything. Yeah. That's how I did that. A black block in his hand. Kind of, yeah. So anyway, scene two, kind of the, wraps that up. Uh, he's all happy, gets back in his car. The keys aren't in the ignition. They're still stuck in the trunk. So it's like, oh, man, he almost, he was going to get out of there. Because he was very frightened while he was changing that tire. He kept seeing, he kept hearing things, and it was not good. So when he finally got in the car, he was relieved that at least he could finally get out of there. Well, then he has to go back to the back to get the keys out of the thing. It's a trunk that required keys. It took a little while to find one that did that. Uh, and then he sees this thing in the road. Dog man standing there, and then within a moment, the dog man just rips him to shreds, and, and he's laying dead on the ground. And that's when the title shows up, Dog Man Two: The Wrath. So we set the tone for the movie. Uh, it's kind of fun. So that's that's sort of what what's going on there. I don't need to go into much detail on this. Go ahead and keep keep scooting. I don't remember why I scanned this, actually. <laughs> I'm looking for uh, 54. Okay, that's what we're looking for. All right. So, okay, 54 is what I'm going to spend some time on tonight because it's kind of fun, I hope. Um, it's a longer scene. It's where a new character, Lloyd, tells his version of the story as to where this dog man thing came from in the first place. And it happens at the tavern at the 10 Pin in Beulah which was a defunct bar, which a whole bunch of great people on the crew painted and, uh, and made it look beautiful. We had props and everything going on. And uh, I went in there first and was listening for sound because the place hadn't been run in, God, I don't know, 12 years or something. And uh, I stood in the middle of this thing and I'm hearing a, a hum, like a transformer. It's like, what? There's nothing on in this building. But I know that I can't record audio here with that going on. I literally tr crawled up in the attic and started disconnecting wires out of a, a junction box until somebody told me I got it. It's like, what the hell is it? What is it, what is it even? It's nothing. It was a transformer for a 30-year-old fluorescent fixture that has been gone. I don't know. Uh, I put it back when we left, so it's still back. <laughs> Okay, so 54 is a bigger scene. It's kind of fun, and this is where Amber might jump in on some of this too, but this is what the screenplay looked like initially. Okay, 54, yada yada. Some t Lloyd jumps in with ladies, and he stands there. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you get the, get the idea here. Lloyd gets very stern. You know each other, every one of those uh, needs to be caught, right? You ever wonder how the whole damn dog man thing got started in the first place? And then he goes into this monologue. And um, it's, it goes on. It's, there's two pages of it, I think. Look at that. And his last line is, then he disappeared. And I've made a note to ourselves that Lloyd stands and returns to his seat. 
And then I struck that other line. And then the people that were listening to the story just stand, they're sitting there just stunned at the story. Then the posse guys come in briefly. Uh, they're going to go out and try to kick some ass in the woods. And Hank's going, how are you guys going to do this? You know, kind of thing. Let the authorities handle it. And they got it all figured out. So Hank says, so which one of you signed up to run through those dogman infested woods in the dark? You know, and they're like, ah. Uh, go home, you'll let the cops handle it. And I have to say this, like when you, I never heard any of these lines spoken out loud until the actors spoke them. You, you ever did a table read? No. Cold read? No. Never. It wasn't until those actors, we were sitting on the front porch in Beulah, in this beautiful front porch, and um, it was like they were, they read, read the, the whole thing right there. Did you even in your screenplay software, did you assign digital voices? So, so what was your decision? That, what was your decision that way, Rich? Why didn't you do at least a table where you just didn't want to? Have the, have I've never have. Okay. Again, I'm. I'm not, but we did do read throughs. Yeah. To, to clarify before we actually did. Just okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So the Sunday before we shot, the first day, we read the whole screenplay on the front porch in Beulah, just to sniff out any rats and see how things were going. That helped give everybody a sense of what they were doing. But then Monday morning, we just started shooting. And then every, the routine was, at the end of the day, we would all grab dinner together. And then after dinner, I would go with the actors, and Amber and Laura, usually, and we would do rehearsals for the very next day. So that the very next day, there was just, everybody was totally on. And if there were some ideas on maybe different ways of saying something, then we'd employ it. You know, it's, the actors all had their scripts way back. Yeah. Than, you know, had time to get their lines down. And yes, absolutely. But I kind of, the reason I kind of brought that up is that when you listen to real actors deliver these lines, it's like, my God, it's like a line like, you know, like I love that line of like, go back up, go, go up a little bit. Hank's line, uh, which I just uh, keep going. Oh. Go, uh, ah, which one of you, which one of you guys is going to go on that <laughs> dog man infested woods at night, that line. But I mean, a line like that, it's like, okay, and, you know, I could say it or think it or whatever, but man, when you hear him say it, and you'll hear it in a minute, it's like that one right there it is. So which one of you sign up to run through those dog man infested woods in the dark? You know, it's like, it's, God, when you hear him say it, it's just magic. His personality shines through. Absolutely. And also perspective, you know, the whole... The whole perspective, his perspective, the character of who he is, I can totally see that he would say something like that. And he's right. You know. Anyway, so keep scooting here. Scrolling or skipping? I can skip the page or. Is this working? Okay. <laughs> so Francis decides to go out on her own into the woods at night. And she's actually relieved that those posse's not going to be there because she feels she has a connection with the dogman mom. And if anybody could pull it off, it'd be her. Okay, so that's that. Okay, keep going. Okay, now, you, once this page leaves us, this is Amber's version of this, <laughs> of what actually happened. Okay, this is fun. Uh, so she highlighted all the dialogue. Uh, just because she was trying to watch that it wouldn't be forgotten, you know, or, or missed, you know. But then one, you can, you want to explain some of this, uh, Amber, do you feel? What, do you, what would you like me to explain? Well, I mean, just all the squiggly lines and all the crazy stuff. Okay. <clears throat> uh, essentially, the story starts with Amber and Hank going to the and me and my trusted ruler and pencil would follow along um, watching for continuity and then also paying attention to the script, which was interesting. Um, and when it had a squiggly line, that means that this line was not quite followed. So in take two, right down in here, just wasn't really what we wanted. But maybe here was great and here was great, not so much there. Um, will you go on now? Yeah. See what else we have. And what would those other ones be then? Where? Well, just the, the other the five on the right side. Well, these would all be perfect. And all takes that we could use. Um, and then we would refer to the actual written out script log that would say, 
of these three takes, was this a good, very good, or no good? And then also have this background information to know maybe this was a good take for everything but here. So we can use all of this and then fill in maybe here and edit that all together. And what about the 1A, 2A, 2B, all that yet? I mean, I'm asking you on their behalf. <laughs> What, you, what, you don't know? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so these are just different camera angles or maybe different lenses. So um, we're in scene 54, and then this is a prop usually the master shot first, normally, and so we would have a wide angled lens. We have one, two, and three, and four, and then we switched, and maybe this is going to be a dirty over close up of Meg talking to Hank, and then B would be the opposite. And so we would see Hank over Meg's shoulder. Um, and, and who knows, um, without my scripty book in front of me, I'm not completely sure on what those were. Um, but it was interesting for me to figure out how to when, when to decide that the script wasn't being followed and when the actors were using their ad lib and it was appropriate. Um, and so that was, that was fun as well. Did you have a mark for that? Um, not necessarily, but I would usually mark it or write it down. In, it, it, a lot of it was when we did the read-throughs the night before. The script would be changed, and so there would be, I would know that ahead of time, we would all know that ahead of time. Um, this is, this is actually fun. I haven't looked at this in a month. Now, like Lloyd sits, is that Lloyd yeah, sits? Yeah, I, I was looking at that. Okay, so, sits at a table? Yeah, so over here where I, where I wrote when he sat down, um, this, these takes here had to be with the, this take here. So the master, wherever Lloyd came and sat down at the table, had to um, coincide with the, the close-up shots. So he had to come over and sit down at the table at the same time. And I just would make a note of that so that if that didn't happen, I would let Rich know and then he would be able to direct the actors properly. But you know, all the actors were so amazing. They, they had that just inherently in them. They knew when they took off a jacket or when they zipped up their coat. It was, it was actually a, quite magical to watch. Um. Power <laughs> zoom on Lloyd? <laughs> yeah. Is that what that says? Yeah, that's what that says. Um, and then so just for, you know, further beating a dead horse, we just have, you know, the masters and then the close-ups and so on and so forth. This was a really long, fun scene, actually. Lloyd, um, a testament to uh, Rich's ability to script the exact right person for these, these different roles. His voice, when, when you guys watch the movie, you will just know <laughs> that this man was the right person for this role. He just has this gravelly, mysterious way about him that no one else could have told the story with the impact that he did. Absolutely. They make our good actors make their job, our job, really easy. Um, but still, you're shooting a scene like this with seven different camera angles, right. not at the same time. So there's going to be even the, the best of worlds. There's going to be like, you know, continuity issues. You know. Yeah, he put his hat on, but he uses other hand, you know, or he, this or whatever, and it's really tricky, and it kind of drives you crazy. But usually, you can fix it in the edit. Usually, there's enough coverage to just disguise it a little bit. And as the letters um, go up, that just essentially means that we're on a different camera angle. So this one in specific, we we're already up to N. Um, this was quite, quite an all-encompassing. <laughs> scene here. Yeah, look at all that coverage. I mean, that's really amazing. Uh, just look at that one. Holy yeah. crap! And you're you're basically figuring out the coverage as you go, right? Or for a scene, you're looking at right the scene. Okay, we're going to need to cover this and this and this now. Uh, we would have discussed it ahead of time, but just about that day. I you mean, know, I might have, have something you in my head. Blocked out. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Or, yeah. M the, Amber's right. The first take always really is the wide shot because that's the most complicated for blocking and everything and uh, also that takes the longest to set up the dolly track and just administer audio and just everything lighting once we got the master done then you can roll in and do the singles and different things pretty quick and what, what's interesting about films like in general is that 
this has never been done. I mean, this this movie's never been done before, so I get to I get to do whatever feels right and feels organic, right? We're creating our own reality. Yeah, we are, and it's a puzzle that's never been made before, and it only starts in the field and in the edit room. Bob's here; he's our editor, and he's he deals with all this stuff at the other end of it. And um, but we want to be as uh, organized as we can so that we have enough coverage, but not too much coverage because I want to keep on schedule. You know, and then this one we had the luxury of, of enough time to cover it. That's amazing to me, all those takes. Of it, but I don't know what was going on there, but but there's a lot of there's five people on at the table. So you know, you do each one of those twice or something, and you got it. You know, so. Um, well, and that's what was going on here because there were so many people sitting down at this table here. We had all the singles of every single person. So. It, this this was a fun this yeah. was a fun one for sure exactly um, it's, we could probably and how, how many hours did you predict this was going to be um, scene fifty four hey go back to the go back to the top yeah, I just think. I'd be curious. that's a good question can you just race to the top that's a really good question I could tell you though I, if I looked at my book go to the very top of the right okay sorry Amber I don't think you covered it but. What's the difference between the yellow highlights and the no yellow highlights? Um, my ADD. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's um, all? No, <laughs> no. Um, a lot of times, no. A lot of times what I would do the night before is, yeah, is um, I would go through and highlight the, um, the actual words that were going to be spoken. So that oh, okay. when I was in the moment, I didn't have to figure out, okay, where Megan and Francis are seated. No, 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 I don't need to pay attention to that. I just need to go right down to Francis saying when I was handed the phone. So when you're in the moment, there's so much going on. Because yeah. as, as I'm paying attention to the script, there's also, are, is there a reflection off of the chrome seat bar seat? Do, do I need to pay attention? Because my head's in, in the monitor. I have a little <laughs> TV mm -hmm. monitor in front of me, and I'm watching what Rich is shooting. And so I'm trying to pay attention to reflections in windows, reflections in um, even uh, the, the glass in a, in a picture frame, those kind of things, as well as trying to listen to everything at once. And continuity And, and then continuity and, and when someone, again, unzipped a jacket or mm -hmm. did all of that. So, so um, you got to get the, the, the stuff you don't need to worry about out of there so right. you can cut straight out the millions of things that you need. Exactly. And so just by highlighting that for me, it made, it made that part of the job more streamlined. Did you find that in your Yeah, no, six hours. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty intense. Yeah. That, that exposition of his, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. That's a pivotal thing. Oh, and it is. It's a huge. And, and by the way, the zoom uh, lens thing, that was a reference to, um, uh, in that scene of Lloyd telling the story, I wanted that shot to take, like to be a zoom, but not to see it. So the, the type of technology that harnesses a, a big lens and be able to zoom it so slowly you don't even notice it's moving. This lens was that long. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful deal. And uh, that's why that notation was on there, I'm guessing, because it was a big deal. And so we shot Lloyd's single wide and then the whole time he's telling the story we're just pushing in and I couldn't do a dolly that would be that long no you way could, yeah you couldn't manually do that no and you'd never be in focus that long so it's like pff, whatever okay so keep scooting and I kind of think what we'll do after I think this is sort of the end of the little scripty stuff here oh and then and then Amber made this up too which uh, was sort of a rehash of her notes uh so this is the log. Um, so as, as I'm also writing and drawing what you guys just saw, the scribbles, um, this is a hand, ha in the field, this is a handwritten version um, of which scene we are, what take, what clip number we are on the Ari, and then also if we're, which kind of shot it is, and then me trying to figure out if, if Rich was a very good or, or not good, or those types of shots, so that in the edit room, Bob can hopefully decipher some of that as if he were there. Um, I say hopefully. You can just just nod your head, Bob. Very, very All, right. All right, thank you. Um, so, but th then I went through and I, I typed this up so it was a little bit easier to read. Because when, when it's go time, I'm sure my shorthand was almost horrific. So. 
<laughs> I tried to make it a little more legible. So you did this after your day and after you did your rehearsals for the next day with the actors? Um, no, we, there was so much going on while we were in the middle of the shoot that um, I did this after we were wrapped. So uh, I, I spent a couple days after. Okay. How long have you been doing this kind of work? <laughs> um, I'm fresh to the business, actually. Wow. Um, and grateful for the opportunity, absolutely. This, this was your first. This is my first. This is my woman. biggest. This is my biggest one. Yeah. <laughs> but what she, but the reason it works for her is, first of all, she's a photographer, and she's got a really good eye, and so she can see stuff. She was uh, bugging me all the time about uh, different things, and I'm just like, oh my god, that's so so small, and it's like, okay, you know, you're you're right though, and she was good about that, and uh, she never lost the ability to keep bugging me about things, and I'm glad of that. Uh, that the blinky lights on the cop cars were one of them. Uh, it's like really, you know. The reflection of the blinky lights. I know we're like specific. two miles from the cop car. Is it still going to blink? Well, it, and but she was right. It, it's absolutely plausible that it would have been there. So I mean, but it was that that attention to detail in the field. And my greatest uh, satisfaction was when a shot happened, and Amber was looking at this beautiful HD monitor. Um, and Henry, my assistant, was watching on either that monitor or a different one, and he was doing all the focus from remote, so he wasn't even near the camera. He'd turn the camera on and off by remote control, wireless, and he's doing follow focus under a tent, like a little fishing shanty, like Ansel Adams or something. <laughs> and so he's in there, and I, I'm seeing him, I'm watching him focus the camera. I mean, it's, it's incredible. In fact, it's so bizarre because, like, you know, you're coming into a shot like this. Here's this zoom sitting on a stick. And all of a sudden, I just you just you, you just want to reach out and mess the mess with the lens, and all of a sudden it just it's there. It's, wow, it made it. And then so my most gratifying moments, which happened a lot, were uh, if it was a particularly cool shot or something kind of tricky, I would see a thumb come out of Henry's tent that signaled that the focus was good, and he liked it. And then Amber would go, no, nah, that was good, that was good. And I was like, move on, move on. With those two guys out watching out for me, it, it couldn't fail. Yeah. So this amount of infrastructure was new to Dogman 2? The... No, well, we didn't have wireless focus on the first one. Um, but um, no, nah, it's all kind of the yeah, same. Yeah, it's evolving. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's all the same. Amber didn't work on the first one. Um, but... Um, but she's going to work on the next one, I'll tell you that. It sounds like you're continually, continually improving your workflow and yeah. adding to it. The tricky thing about that around here is that, you know, none of us are really, like, she's got other things going on. You got Everybody has a sure. gig, you know, already, a day job kind of even. So if you're in, a, in Hollywood and you're doing ten movies a year or five movies a year or two movies a year even, you can almost make a career out of that. And then you really perfect your craft. The problem here, and it's a huge problem, is finding people that are, have a schedule that's flexible enough to be able to jump in and do audio, do this, do that, do script supervising, do whatever, because they just get busy with their career, and I get it. And uh, so it's that's part of the wiggly part of this region that we're in. And uh, I mean, you, nobody's going to retire on this one movie, and it's only, th especially, it only take three weeks to shoot it. You know. Well, maybe uh, there's a maybe that's. I mean, we can't really get out of that situation for the foreseeable future. So maybe that's. Maybe we're developing something new. Yeah. Well, my solution and my comments to the Michigan Film Office for the incentives and all that stuff is that if that thing were to continue or to get better, and it's actually pretty good, and we did get the incentive on this movie, or we will, is that that theoretically would allow me to do two of these a year. Yeah. So if, if I could do two of these a year, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if I assembled a crew that, was, that enjoyed it and were good at it, you know, then it might be more attractive for those people to stick stick with it, and they get better at it. You know, yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, but generally, the crew is is, is is for some reason they they tend to be able to pull off three weeks somehow. Because uh, everybody's so happy to be involved. It's I mean, cool. It's, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. an experience that you cannot get yeah. any anywhere else in this area. Right. And we don't work weekends, so people can go home on weekends. This is a little premature, Rich, but it seems to me, you know, now that we're going through this and we're actually, you know, documenting, did you have any consideration of doing, like, let me bring a small team of making of people just to follow a whole show? We have one. You did? Yeah, we do oh, have a making of. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I do that for sure. Okay. Um, 
And that'll be with the DVD when it's done. But yeah, yeah, definitely. That's really fun to do. And I've not seen any of it. Nice. So I, I, I was shot by these guys. And uh, you, have you seen any of it? A little. <laughs> okay. I think that's the end of this. Uh, yep. Yay! Okay. Colin's so, here, by the way. Oh, Colin's here? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Well, that'll come into play here. Um, Naomi, could you put that other disc in? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know where the eject button is. I don't either. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, I did it. Okay. Now, this is, uh, and I have no intention of showing the whole thing, but this is raw camera footage. Uh, no, I'll show the raw first. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is right out of the camera. I think we shot we shot for six hours. It sounded like, and there was roughly I think it was an hour and a half of material. And um, for this scene that really only takes five minutes, roughly in the movie. Yes. Yeah, we were almost always on time. And the, and the thing is, one of the resources of making independent cinema is time. And I have to respect it. You know, and the only time we violate it is when stuff starts just going crazy and it just does something's not working. But um, something like this, it's a total in control, it's almost a studio set. Uh, we did have to stop for traffic once in a while because we did not do road closure in front of the bar. So every once in a while, some motorcycles or somebody would wander by, and it was like... Yeah, we did have a drunk... Uh, yeah, there it is. That's what? Hang on. Plug it. So draft footage, Rich? Yes. Just a second. No, yeah, scene 54 of footage. One second. We're having a little issue. Technical difficulties. So much better when there's two people. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, oh my god. It's all my fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> what was cool though is this uh, set, it was a defunct bar, of course, when we got it, and then it was all painted up and we dressed it with lights and twinkly rope lighting and booze bottles with corks and the whole thing. Fixed all their practical lights so it all looked great. And when we were done shooting there, the owner said, can you just leave all this stuff? Because it looks cool. And so we didn't have to even clean it up. We basically moved our stuff out and walked away. It was, it was cool. We've got to come back into it. Something is hanging up big time here. Sorry, just a second. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> How about some other questions or thoughts or whatever? I'd like to say something. Right? Yeah. Um, based off of the, the time schedule and, and how we adhered to it so beautifully, um, I truly believe that it's because you guys had the Everybody was busting their butt every single minute it was go time. Um, it, it didn't matter who it was or, or what their job role was. Everybody was equal and, and really put everything into it. And that's, that's why this got done in three weeks within the complete parameters that you thought it would be. Yeah. It's like a wall choreographed dance. Really. It was. It really <laughs> is. I, I mean, looking at it from the sidelines, that's, you know. And if you do that much planning, before you even start, it's just going to go smoother. It has to, yeah. And, it, and it's really, you really got to just treat it all evenly, all the way along. Every part of it, filing for all those stupid papers and reports and all that, that's just all part. I mean, it's just like putting the dolly on the track. It's like everything is all a part of it. And if you embrace it and not just squawk about it, I will squawk about the SAG thing. But other than that, <laughs> uh, it's pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, I never storyboard. Um, once in a while, we'll, we'll draw something on a napkin, but rarely. <laughs> uh, but I use Dolly Track a lot. I, well, that Dolly played a lot uh, in our movie, and, uh, and it, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, I've got 44 feet of straight track and a, and a couple of curves on top of that. And several times we had all of it out. And, uh, and it might wrap around a tree, you know, from way over there. Um, thank you. And, uh, but it's always motivated. I try to not have them just be gratuitous, but there is something about 
a camera moving um, that is that adds some dra drama to the thing. But at but if it gets overused, I'm you know I don't really go that route either. But I've got all this this great dolly, and I've got a team of people that know how to hook it up, you know, and it's pretty nice. And we we do jibs too on it. It's got a pneumatic head that allows it to. So sometimes we do a jib and a dolly at the same time. Start up here and then it crawls down like that, you know, whatever. But it's because somebody sat down and we wouldn't see them if we didn't go low. You know, so it's driven. It's propelled by some organic thing going on in the shot. We also have a, a, a barber boom, a 12-foot barber boom that I bought from Pee Wee Herman, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, it was the one that was on the set of Pee Wee Herman's uh, Playhouse or Funhouse or whatever it was. That, that, that one, it's not one like it, it's that one. And uh, it lives on my truck and we did a really sweet shot uh, in the woods with that thing. Uh, camera's looking straight down and it pulls up and that's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, yeah she's right, okay. Well, as far as the dolly track, I have to tell this one scene, that there was a picture of it in the behind the scenes, but it was exterior in the, the farmhouse, Hank's farmhouse. And we had every piece of straight dolly track, every piece of curved dolly, dolly track, every block, <laughs> because it was about a two-foot drop from the one end to the other end, and it had to be leveled. And I, I would not have wanted to be riding on that dolly, but it was solid enough. Well, you tell me that now. You had to... <laughs> Jeez. We told Richard it was good, and he was fine. Yeah, and it did look great. Uh, all right, so this is just going to be kind of... What I'm going to do is show you the behind the actual camera footage. I mean, this, is, this stuff is not necessarily new to any of you guys that have cut film together because uh, it's all logical uh, again. But I just want to show you what we went through to capture scene 54. And I don't intend to show you the whole hour and a half of it. We'll, we'll speed up a bunch of it. But go ahead and play a little bit of it. Here, I'm going to shut this light off, can I? shoot the rehearsal, which is not something I would do in film, but we learn a lot, and uh, like the mic placement, like how fast should the dolly get to where it needs to get. Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh could you just goose the floor a little bit, please? Where to? If you tab it, it'll, I think Bob set it up so it'll go right to the next slide and put a chat on it. What, just skip like that? No. No? Nope. Oh, not that far back. Okay, hang on. Yeah, because you're using VLC. Yeah, exactly. This is this. Oh, man, dog, man, I think that started in the first place. Well, when I was a kid, my grandpa told me this story kind of makes sense. Started in the early 1800s. Government sent crews out to explore the unknown territories and draw maps. Each team had two men, two dogs. One in particular got stuck, snapped in the middle of the 100 year blizzard. Dug themselves into a six foot stone to best they could hunker down. Endure it for days, maybe weeks. But they had to get the hell out of there and die. This is that power zoom shot. But they packed up the gear. It's actually zooming right now. You just can't even see right it. Off the back. Yep. One of them slipped on something. Broke his leg. Compound fracture. Oh, that's a little bit of a shock. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit of a shock. Yeah. 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 Cut some meat off his dead friend, fed it to the dogs, and then they left. After okay. traveling 
You see the focus that just happened? Yeah. Henry did that. Did that. But he also, Henry knew that I'd be able to cut away to one of the people listening. So it's like it's legal. He said he knew he could pull it off if he did it quick. You got to delete the dog. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. The guy got back to Chicago, he picked up a new line of work. Pretty difficult situation. Eventually, he and the other dog made it back to Chicago, he picked up a new line of work. Okay, go ahead and just keep going. Got married, had some kids, normal stuff. I know a different story. The helicopters, God knows what will be here, Francis. They're going to get them. Francis, there's things across the line that have to be stopped. Hey! Wait, did you not hear this story? I know a different story. C-54J, take two. We are all wrong. Yep. 
Scene 54, I'll take six. Mark. We are rolling for one. Mm -hmm. Well? They're not going out. Oh, you just bought me a couple of hours to look for Sadie. Thank no, you. Wait, that's a terrible thing. <laughs>
and drove for days, maybe a week. But they had to get the hell out of there, dying. So they packed up the gear and headed out into the storm. But right off the bat, one of the men slipped on something, broke his leg, compound fracture. In a couple of days, he was dead. The other man hung around a day or so, and knew he had to give it another try. But the dogs were in no shape to travel. We hadn't eaten in days. So the man cut some meat off his dead friend, fed it to the dog. And then they left. But after a couple of days of traveling in the snowstorm, the man tried to feel himself getting delirious from starvation. So he, he killed one of the dogs and ate it. Yeah, put a different situation. Eventually, he and the other dog made it back to Chicago. He picked up a new line of work, got married, had some kids, his normal stuff. And then he began behaving oddly. Shortly after that, he went completely crazy. People would see him at the edge of town at night, facing the woods, making a sad, singing kind of sound. These things kill in the broad daylight. So which one of you signed up to run through these dogman infested woods in the pitch black at night? Go home, guys. Let the cops handle it. They need to be stopped. Yeah, I don't know. He may be right. You guys are pathetic. Well? They're not going out. Oh, thank God. We just thought a couple of hours to look for Sadie. No, that's crazy. No one's going out in those woods tonight. Listen, pretty soon then, the state police helicopters, God knows what, will be out there. They're going to get them. Francis, those things have crossed the line. They have to be stopped. Hey. Did you not hear his story? I know a different story. is a terrible idea. I'm going with you. Absolutely not. I have to get back out there and I've got to go alone. Meg, damn it, I can't believe this is happening. Do you at least have a cell phone? I guess I know. I really don't like you doing this. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with the music in there, I mean, you heard Blake, we were talking about Blake Elliott. So it starts with Blake, clearly bar music, and then as soon as Lloyd starts telling his story, all the sounds in the bar go away, and it's just Lloyd. And what's probably gonna happen in there when our, our score is made uh, for the whole movie, there'll probably be some sort of, it might be just stay like it is, or I might opt to put a drone in there, just to like a, just a, just a, because when Blake's tune, fades away, we put it that way, there, there'll be this other thing waiting for it. And it'll just be this thing. And then when he gets up and leaves, then it, the opposite happens. It could be kind of fun. But anyway, that was six hours on whatever day it was. And then we had lunch and moved on, you know. The guy that played Lloyd, who is he? He's fabulous. 
Yeah, he's a professional actor, Will Young. Uh, he's been in a lot of movies, uh, a lot of shows. He's, I met him at the Purple Rose Theater Company in Chelsea, which I hang out at a lot. And uh, he's been in a bunch of my movies even. Uh, but he was in Super Sucker. Is it, who's, did anybody here see Super Sucker? I'm just curious. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, how about Escanaba in the Moonlight? Yeah. Okay. Well, Jeff Daniels uh, wrote Escanaba in the Moonlight as a play. And uh, I saw it as a play and laughed my butt off and told him to make a great movie. He agreed, and he let me be the director of photography of Escanaba and Moonlight the movie, and Bob did the editing on it, shot it in 35 millimeter. And then a year later, uh, he had written a screenplay called Super Sucker, and it was about a vacuum cleaner salesman who, uh, it, I don't know, it was kind of ahead of its time a bit. <laughs> But nobody's ever seen it. And, it, and if you watch it, it's really a funny movie. So anyway, Lloyd's in that. There's a scene of Lloyd naked in a rubber raft in a basement, um, which I can't get out of my head, uh, even now. <laughs> it's very disturbing. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's where I met all these guys. And it's part of the, a, a community, just like technicians and, and crew and everything. It's like talent's the same thing for me. I'm able to write this stuff for Larry and, and I know how he thinks and I know how he talks. So generally it comes out about right, you know. If I was working with a brand new actor, it might be a different thing. You know, I might have to do a little more homework on it, you know, uh, whatever. But, well, does anybody else have any questions or uh, thoughts? Uh, picture's locked, you say? What's that? Picture is locked? Yeah, picture's locked pretty much. Well, locked is a relative term. Uh, it's, it, uh, before I hand it to the, my uh, score guys in Grand Rapids, it's supposed to be locked, obviously. So I think we've sent three drafts off to them so far and probably get another one out this weekend. Um, it, they, they're fundally, fundamentally the same, but it's, they're tweaking it here and there. And there's stuff that's a little shorter than maybe he thought or maybe a little longer now. Uh, but we owe it to him to keep him current anyway. <laughs> but at the end of the day, he's coming up with the right mood for the thing. And, hitting the high points. He's using a, a sampling uh, device that samples uh, instruments, so it's all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a real cello that's been sampled, it's, and it's that kind of stuff, and he's very good at it. He did the first movie, too. But I can't wait for that to happen. By the way, we're going to have a screening, theoretically, of this movie uh, in a month at the State Theater. Uh, but we just shot this thing in September. So yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And we're doing sound. Bob and I are working on, well, he's doing most of it. And I keep assigning him crazy things that are hard, like a lot of CGI kind of stuff where we're repairing things or getting people out of shots and stuff like that. And, uh, but he's good at it. He knows he can do it. I know he can do it. So there you go. And it makes the story better. So at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So hats off to Bob for putting up with all that, too. <laughs> he's been at my studio for... Uh, was it 22 years now or something? So it's been a while. So, uh, all right, well, that's kind of the, unless, uh, Dan, did you, Dan, Dan's, who's, part of the crew, hang on a second, the, the crew that is here that works with me, you met uh, Amber, Dan Pearson's here, he's on our uh, uh, gaffing, are you the gaffing world or gripping world? I forget. Well, actually, that's something I wanted to mention, is that I was, you know, technically listed as second gaffer on this movie, but our richest crews, we have such a small crew, that, you know, I do gaffer work, I do grip work, I do anything that, that is necessary. Gaff and, and grip world are pretty interchangeable on Rich's sets, and that makes it nice. Um, you know, you don't get bored, well, you never get bored on the set anyway, but you get to do a lot of things that, that you're not so locked into it as you might be in a larger production. Right, and grip and electric is in the same truck in my world, too. Right. So, it, they, they're, like Dan's been on a ton of shoots with me, and he knows where stuff is in the truck. By the way, Dan, I'm missing a mag light about that long black yeah, you one. Yeah, mentioned that. It's, it's, it's in my basement with the coat that you think Yeah, is okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Colin was here, but he left. Is that what I heard? Uh, and I guess uh, and most of these guys are out and about. You know, they're out doing stuff. But um, anyway, I thank those guys that are here especially. Uh, but it's a great crew. And what's fun about it is because we eat three meals a day together, during the shoot, it's really quite pleasant, you know, and you really get to know people and, uh, and you get to know, you get, you get reminded why you're hanging around with these people. It's a sense of family. It really is. And that's kind of a, often a cliche, but it's, it's totally true on this thing. And, and uh, one night, I, I should tell this story, uh, we were done, 
one night out on uh, Highway 29, and we had done the night stuff, and it was a full moon, right? And it was, uh, we were hearing coyotes like that whole night circling around. And it was a scene where Kimberly screams in the woods at night. And that, that's what triggered these coyotes to get a little closer somehow. So people were starting to wind, wind up their stuff and we were all kind of taken off. And Amber and I was, who else, was anybody else there? Or was it Henry or somebody? I don't remember. People were gonna start wandering off. Anyway, we went up to where we had just been shooting and I had this flashlight that Dan's stolen from me. And it was a really good one that focused nicely. And I spotted this, uh, we, Amber and I were sitting there in the middle of the night in this middle of this woods and there it was. And here was this coyote just sitting there, just barking at us. Just chirp. Just not panic, not freaked, not aggressive, not anything. It was just barking at us. Did you have that lady from Chicago yeah. on the set? Was she? No, yeah, no. no. Don't shine that light in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> you need sunglasses on the coyote. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, no, this was behind it. This, after the movie's done being shot, you can get away with anything. You can kill stuff right and left. Um, but it was a really special moment, and uh, we had some pretty good recording, audio recording of him barking up there, but it was just cool. And then there's a scene where we have a deer heart that Lorna, the lunatic, throws away from Hank's refrigerator. And, uh, there's a lot of subplots in this thing, but there's a, we had a frozen deer heart uh, as a prop, a real one. It might have been her pig, but it, in the movie it's a deer heart. And uh, so we offered that up. Chelsea Tanner, I think, ran that up, one of our PAs, and chucked it in the woods uh, where this coyote was. And it took a day or two to thaw out, and then it was gone. And uh, so we made friends with our little neighbors, and it was kind of cool, <laughs> special time. So that, uh, anyway, that's sort, of, that's sort of it. Now it's in the edit room, and, and theoretically in a month people will like it, and and, uh, Quick question on uh, weapon protocol. Yeah. Obviously, these guys have the weapons. You have somebody who's in charge of that. Yep. Everybody's aware of that protocol on the set. But what about when you had the Benzie sheriffs on the set? Did you have a different protocol because they had their own guns? They were never on the set. Oh, they weren't? Okay. No, they actually handed us keys. It's unbelievable. To the, to the cars? Mm hmm. And we had, uh, I have a pistol, a Sig Sauer 229 cop pistol. It's a stage theater pistol, so it can't shoot anything that way, even though it looks like it is. And uh, that's what we arm our deputy with. Uh, the only actual guns that were out there were the prop guns, like the ones you saw these three clowns carrying in. One of those was a, and I kind of forgot about it until just now, it's a double-barreled shotgun uh, that would belong to my grandfather when he was a kid. It's a 10 gauge <laughs> from the turn of the century. You can't shoot the thing anymore, but it's in there too. Sort of an homage to my grandfather. But, um, but anyway, we always had one of our, our uh, crew, uh, Andrea was in charge of making sure everybody knew that this thing was empty because uh, we don't want any trouble. And we did have um, what looked like live ammo in a scene, but it was actually reloaded ammo with no firing pin and no gunpowder in it. It was just buckshot in a reloaded 12 gauge shell or casing. And then we had another scene we wanted to shoot of a gun discharging, that's a different shotgun firing. And uh, I, we had it reloaded with, um, instead of buckshot, it had, uh, what, do you guys remember, what, was that cream of wheat or something? It was cream of wheat. I think it was cream of wheat. Yeah, cream of wheat. And so it was gunpowder with a little wadding and a bunch of cream of wheat. And uh, you fire that off into space and it's pretty impressive. And, uh, uh, but you can't really get hurt with it, I guess. But it's pretty scary still. But then, but it's all handled correctly, and we all had ear protection and eye protection. You know, the whole thing is very careful. And uh, yeah, you can't, you don't want to have any trouble. Uh, no, yeah. not, not like that. But so, we. So, Rich, I, I just wanted to kind of cut to some of the, the a more pragmatic, overarching theme here. So, obviously you can continue to afford to do these movies. How's your profit margin on a film project like this? What do you anticipate being able to make? Uh, I can't answer that because it's like creating a piece of artwork. You know, you put some paint on a canvas yep. and it might sit there for your whole life. Yep. But don't your investors expect something back from you? What's the 
Are there any investors here tonight? Um, yeah, there, there's. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question, and uh, the, the, this isn't a hobby at this point. I mean, I got to make this work, and there's money on the table. And the, the here's the good thing about where we're at right now: uh, Michigan Film Office has the incentive there, even though it's got a diminishing point at, in uh, 017 or something or whatever uh, coming up. So every year it gets a little less, but right now it's at roughly 25 percent, and uh, so. If you just take any average investment right now, and if it gets you 6%, you're doing pretty good, kind of. So the way I look at that is I got four years to figure out how to sell this thing. Because they do get 25% back as an incentive. Mm -hmm. And so that helps a lot. It helps that, that math work. I'm not trying to uh, avoid it exactly, but it's, it's a huge risk. Yeah. This is a giant risk every single time. And some of them make it better than others. And I can't explain why one would or why one wouldn't. It doesn't, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge risk. All the investors are, they're supportive of me. I'm one of them too, so they're not paying my freight. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not like, uh, they, they refer to it as eating your own cooking when, when you are an investor along with them. And uh, basically they're covering all the other costs. And, uh, and it works out like that. So when they know that I'm vested like they are, even more so, then they kind of go, you know, this is cool. It's kind of fun. And we get to come visit the set and, you know, and he's not, you know, I'm trying to work. We work hard at this. We take it seriously. We take it, we're professional at it. Whether it sells or not is, it's like set up a car wash on the corner. You know, you buy a piece of property, you hire an architect and a builder and go through all the licensing. And then right when you launch it, you find out somebody put another one on the other corner, you know, that's cheaper or better or whatever. And it's like, oh, you know, and it's, it's like that. Yeah. It's like, and there's a lot of people in this room that are prone to taking risks with art. And, and this is just a massive commercial art risk every single time. Sure. Uh, but at the end of the day, we hire a lot of cool people as crew. The talent gets it that we all take care of each other. And at least that, we, we get that. Mm -hmm. and, and we have four years of coasting until we, gotta, we find a way to market this thing. But the other dog man, other than being ripped off by those some clown on YouTube. It does have North American release, but it's brutal. I, a friend of mine sent me a, a photograph of a, a DVD pack in Walmart that he had spotted. Eight sci-fi movies in this DVD bundle. One box with eight, with eight movies in it. Dogman is one of the movies. So initially I'm thinking, hey, cool, you know? Okay, then you start doing the math. Okay, it's like, all right, well, first of all, everything at Walmart's consignment. So only if it sells does anybody get anything. But let's say somebody buys it for probably 10 bucks or, or whatever. Nobody's going to buy it, right? I mean, it might be 12, but let's just say 10 bucks for eight movies. Walmart takes half, so there's 50 or five bucks left. Um, whoever packaged it gets their money back first. So let's say it costs five grand to package and place so that money comes back first so out of that five dollars that are left that gets whittled away at that five thousand dollars first once the five thousand dollars is satisfied or whatever the number is then you throw the my distributors take which is 30 percent onto it everybody's distributors take is that so now you got five dollars minus 30 percent so now you're down to 350 or something or whatever and uh, so you got three dollars and fifty cents on the on the table, and they got eight producers diving in for that three and a half bucks. That's assuming all that happens. So it's the payout is on that particular uh, route is a pretty horrible, depressing. Uh, and if that was all there was, I, obviously none of this would work. But somehow that stuff happens, you know. And I'm not sure it's even better than being ripped off on YouTube. Because at least YouTube, I can just say one guy pirated it, and that's that. But this other thing is, is Walmart made more money than, way more money than anybody did. Um, and I'm not beating them up, but it's just the way the system is. It's like, us producers are such at the bottom of the food chain on this thing, it's ridiculous. So what you hope for is a TV deal uh, through some network, uh, foreign or otherwise, and that's what, those, those work out well. But those, that's diminishing too. Back years ago when I, you know, did a movie back in like, 2000 or something like that, we would sell to Germany, Spain, and Italy 
for big money, huge amounts of money. And it'd be like, wow, that's fantastic. And it'd be a license deal. And so five years later or three years later, they come around and do it again. So that's, that's what was exciting. Today, those same markets are paying 6% of what they used to pay because the market is so glutted up with stuff. And it, I don't know, it's weird. Yeah. So the, the market is a shifting, wiggly thing, hugely risky. But at the end of the day, we love what we do and it's fun. I, 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 I get such a kick out of it. And as long as I can wrangle these investors into going and playing the game with me, they know it's a risk. A lot of them are in the oil and gas business and they're used to big risk, you know. They get nothing. At least I get four years of 6%, you know. Any, any value to you in doing the film festival route with a project at this stage of the game? Uh, I, don't, I don't do film festivals. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just died it. I'm stupid, probably. Uh, I just, it's too much work. Yeah. I want to go do another movie. Yeah, yeah. And really, it's the distributors. I know I have a pretty good pulse on some distributors out in LA. So those are the guys that are taking it and supposedly running with it. Let them deal with it. They told me that, um, I mean, this is horrible. They're so brutal. Um, they said, you know, there's only six festivals that matter, they say to me. So if you get into Toronto, Sundance, Tribeca, uh, LA and one other one. If you get, or South by South, one of those, like there's six. Any other ones that we don't even bring it up. It's like, but there's a thousand festivals out there and they're cool, you know, and it's fun to win, you know, and, mm -hmm. but they are such hard nosed uh, marketers that they, they don't know, care. They don't care, yeah. right. And the worst part about that whole thing here, I mean, this is the dark seedy side of all this, is that if your movie doesn't sell within the first couple of months in their bucket, it just gets shoved to the back of the burner, on the back burner. And there's another one just like you sitting there on the front burner. And they're gonna do the same with that one for a couple months and then they'll push that one back. And it's, it's difficult. So anyway, I, it's, that's all a scary, depressing side. It makes you wanna just hang drywall for a living or something. But so what's the upside? that is a good question. The upside is I get to work with cool people like you and Dan and all the rest of the crew. And, and we're giving it, are giving it hell, you know, and we're a bunch of artists at the end of the day. And look at all the sculptures in the other room over there. You know, it's like, I don't know, are they, are they selling? Uh, you know, that crazy wheelchair thing with the spinny yeah. thing that I want to end up with someday. It's like, really? Well, that thing. But it's cool, you know? But it's like you just never know. Yeah. And you just never know. What's that? You still own all your movies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? I directed Ernest Borgnine four times, and there was a company that said, hey, we're trying to acquire all Borgnine's movies. I'm going, wow. Yeah, that's interesting. And. They're fun movies. The guy's amazing. He passed away two years ago now, but uh, at age 95, uh, he was an amazing man. I miss him terribly. And But they wanted, again, marketing people, they want, hey, Borgnine movies, that'll sell. And, uh, okay. But that, that, didn't, that deal didn't quite get, we haven't done it yet, but it's still out there, I guess. So you just never know what rock these crazy marketing people are going to trip on. And, uh, but in the meantime, we just plow ahead. So the upside, uh, we're, we're honorable. We, we do the right thing. We, chew, we work our asses off. We have a lot of fun, and we create the best product we can, and we just hope for the best. And, uh, and if we really do it right and we luck into the right timing and the right market, theoretically, the investors make money, and they roll it again with us. And that's that hope, that wonderful thing that we have called hope right here here oh. i want to just thank rich for coming in and uh doing this with us and you know before you clap it's just you know we need more of this we need more you know hearing from people with experience and and just you know even in this way of being kind of involved in the project and seeing what happened and how it was done really helpful really great cool so rich thank you so much well my pleasure <laughs> And even though, even though Dan's operating in a vacuum half the time, he wants to have help. Yeah. So anybody that wants to give him a hand. <laughs> help him. Yeah,
So there is dancing and uh, more hanging out. You know, feel free to hang out here. We're done tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Hey, Rich. Almost two and a half hours. Man. So I got a question for you. Can I keep the PDFs and insert them in the video? Yeah, that'd be the way to do it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, we didn't actually shoot. Well, there's some of these shots far away. So, yeah. and you want to show me any of this stuff? Do you need me to help you in any way? Yeah, because I don't think that you're going to see it. I'll just cut to it. Oh, cut to it. And I'll just give it all back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.